You know what you're listening to? Is that a trick question? It's the I Still Love This Game podcast with your host, Matthew Damien. He's an idiot. Don't listen to this. He's an idiot. Hello and welcome back to the I Still Love This Game podcast. And before I get into the details of this episode... I'd just like to say what a what a great feeling it is to be back on the I Still Love This Game podcast. As you guys have noticed, uh, the last few episodes have been Garbage Time. That is the name of the new extra show, and I've been putting that up on the podcast because I've been including uh, some NBA topics as well. But if you're interested in me talking about American football or potentially talking about rugby, especially the Rugby World Cup coming up, or anything sports-related that is not the NBA... Check it out on YouTube. Check it out on Facebook. It is called Garbage Time, and there will be a it will be its own podcast in due time. Uh, once I get an intro for it, <laughs> but the time is here, and we're up to episode one hundred. But this is something I'm proud of, and because I'm proud of it, I wanted to do it right, and I had a few options running around my head as to what to do for this episode. Uh, the first option was just to bring on an, an ex-NBA player. Uh, I mean, been in touch with quite a few of them. I often bounce ideas off them, try to get some knowledge of the game a little bit deeper than what we see off TV or, or at the games if we're there. And I thought that that would be cool, you know, get an ex-NBA player on, talk about their career, talk about what they see in the game or whatever. But then I thought there was an opportunity for me to actually open up to you guys a little bit more because I I often get questions they're not as prevalent as <laughs> LeBron James versus Jordan or, or the other ones but pretty much every week I'll get two or three emails or messages asking me questions about my personal life and I guess there's a curiosity factor there you know me being an Aussie moving over to the United States as I've, I've told you guys uh, on previous episodes so I, I guess there's a little bit of curiosity there as to what my background is so I thought maybe I'd get Prior guests onto the show, uh, the Matt Hanleys, the Ernest Christians. Uh, Ernest Christian hasn't been on my show yet. I've been on his quite a few times, and that's going to be a hell of an episode when he comes on. Uh, he was actually the first guy I ever interviewed uh, back on the Outside the Hype days, but we'll leave that for another day. Uh, but yeah, Ernest, uh, Matt Hanley, uh, you know, Houston White, Mike Fry, all those guys, right? I was going to get them all on, and we just have a a very loose discussion and you can sort of understand who I am just from a conversation. So that was what I was going to do. So obviously it's not what I'm going to do now because that's what I'd be doing. Instead, I'm going to get a lot more personal. And when I, when I said that there's a bunch of questions that I often get, you know, why'd you move to the United States? You know, tell me about your rugby career. I get all those questions, but another one that I get is why, why is an Australian doing a a podcast about basketball? And that's, that's a good question. And there's a good answer to it. So this episode is a tribute to the, the person that motivated me the most to start writing, to start talking basketball. And that is the late Josh McDonald, who was my best friend at the, at, at the time. And, I'm nervous, you know, <laughs> it's funny, I never get nervous, but I get ner- I'm nervous now because this has to be done right, and it's been a while, it's been a while since I've talked about him, so let's, let's start at the very beginning, and I remember playing against Josh, Josh was, you know, I, I would play basketball, um, I, I don't even know what the equivalent is over here in the United States, but there would be uh, an A grade competition. So you have your, it's not even rec league. It's, it's like a local competition. And we, w- our team would play up against Josh's. And there was another dude on that team named Jamie Newf. And I'm not sure if he listens to the show, but I, I looked up to him a lot. He was, he was a great player, very quick, could shoot unbelievably well. And, uh, those were the two best players on that team. And we could never beat them. By the way, we tried to. Uh, we would like when I say we can never beat them. Never in a meaningful game, not in a grand final or semi finals. We would probably beat them one out of ten games because <laughs> they were good. They were really good. I remember, you know, sometimes they'd have a game prior to us, or we would go first, and then we'd 
you know, st- stick around and watch their games. I remember trying to fi- figure out Josh McDonald. And I couldn't do it, man. I could not figure it out because he, he was very, very versatile as a basketball player. Uh, about six foot six, six foot seven, incredibly athletic for his size. Um, obviously, I've seen people that could jump high, but I've never seen people that could actually move their feet as quick as as he could at that size. Uh, he had a post game, and, and for some of the younger audience now, uh, the post game is actually when you have your back to the basket. Look, I'm kidding. Of course, you know what a post game is. <laughs> I'm just being a smart ass. But Josh was on the was a guy that I looked up to in terms of competition. And I never told him at that point because you know, he was my competition. So I, I tried to figure him out a little bit, try to understand. But there were certain people you just couldn't figure out because they always had a counter. And you force them left and they go left. You know, you force them right, they go right. You you play a foot off and then you try to to meet them at a, at a point of well, where, where you feel that they're most comfortable. So you take them a little bit further out from that. He a step back jumper on you. All right, you start to pressure, uh, start to really crowd him. So he may, to make a uh, a catch difficult, the dude just goes straight into the post. He knew exactly what he was doing at all times, and I, I was impressed by that. I was really impressed with that. And then I remember I had a bit of a falling out with the team that I was playing on. I'm not going to get into that. Believe me, they don't deserve any time uh, of my day, let alone on this podcast. And Jamie reached out to me and asked if I would like to play uh, alongside him. And I thought, great, that'd be awesome. You know, because I don't have to guard you anymore. <laughs> you know, referring to Jamie. Jamie was a hell of a player, man. And, uh, and of course, the, the kicker and all that, it was I, I get to be on Josh's team. Now, prior to that, I, I got along with Josh. I remember talking to him as we were about to leave and he was coming in. And I just randomly just started talking to him. Very, very friendly guy. He's a class act all the way, man. And that that was a that was we didn't speak a whole lot until we became teammates. And I remember going in to to get some shots up before a game, and here he was pulling in as well. And I was like, "Hey, what are you doing here?" And he goes, "Oh, I'm getting some shots up." I'm like, "Great, we let's be shooting partners." So you know, obviously we rebound for each other, we count up how many makes and misses for the other guy, and all that good stuff. And from that point is when we really started to connect. And he was a huge Dwayne Wade fan, an unbelievably big Dwayne Wade fan. And with that, he was also a Miami Heat fan. Now, me and him were really starting to learn the NBA at the same time. And I, I got Bill Simmons' book because people have told me, you know, get his book. Uh, he'll, it's a very, very good historical book. Now, I tell people to go get David Halberstam's book. Because it's a better book, <laughs> but regardless, we, I got Bill Simmons' book. I read it. I didn't like it. I've read it again recently, and I like it a little bit better than when I first read it. However, I still there's still a lot about it that leaves that's left to be desired. Uh, but I lent it to Josh. I loaned that book to him, um, and he read it too. And this was just before the whole decision thing came down with LeBron, and. I remember we couldn't believe the hypocrisy of this guy because if you've ever read Bill Simmons' book, he refers to this thing called The Secret and he, he cares more about, and this is on the back cover of his book too, but he cares more about players that make sacrifices in order to to win. You know, a guy that will you know take less money or average five less points per game or whatever it is in order to make sure the team is successful. Now, what LeBron did by going to, to Miami as much as I hated that, it was almost following the blueprint of the 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 success, uh, the secret, excuse me, formula laid out by Bill Simmons, and Bill Simmons ripped him for this. We absolutely went on a tirade. I, I'll never forget. Josh gave me a call and he goes, "What is wrong with this guy? He's so hypocritical." And maybe, just maybe, that's why I'm such a I'm so strict uh, amongst standards. But that's a mouthful to say. A lot of S's in that. <laughs> so strict amongst standards. And uh, because of that, because it, you need to be consistent with your standards. You know, if if something, if Jordan, like for example, if Jordan got up and said that he's a goat after me ripping LeBron for it, I'm not going to say, well, Jordan's allowed to say it. 
because I've just ripped LeBron for doing that. I would have to rip Jordan for that. That's my point. And, and the, the inconsistencies with Bill Simmons. And look, I hated that book much, a, a long time before LeBron uh, went to Miami. And the reason I hated it, it was too much of a fanboy. And Josh liked the book until the whole LeBron thing. So we had great conversations about it. And we're like, dude, to hell with him. Let's make our own top 50. Because the the book about... The book, I'm not sure, if you've never read it before, there's some overview of history. There's a chapter dedicated to Russell versus Chamberlain. Uh, there's a chapter about the greatest teams of all time. But the majority of the book is ranking the top players of all time. And I'm not sure exactly where it starts. There's more than 50. It may be 75. It might... I, don't quote me on it. But around this time, we started really playing together. And our, our team was going very well. This is the best team I've ever been on by far and away. Because it wasn't just uh, Josh and Jamie. There was another guy on that team named uh, Steven Singh. And I've never seen a catch-and-shoot guy with a quicker release. He's more consistent. Like I've, Obviously, I've seen better in the NBA or whatever. I've never played with a guy as good as that. I used to love just... He, this dude would just run baseline to baseline. If I was running point, dude, I, I I was always confident that if I just got him the ball on his chest, it does unless if the guy is within a couple of inches of him, he's going to get that shot up. And he was deadly, man. I don't know what he's up to these days, but Steve, if you're listening to the show, you know I hope you're doing well. But though I, it, Steve was a bit older than us, and Steve wanted the. Uh, the Miami Heat to lose. And to a lesser extent, I did too. But a part of me wanted to see them succeed. And you're probably going to laugh at that when you hear some of the stuff that I say about LeBron. But it's because, you know, I'd be happy for Josh. You know, I'd be very, very happy for Josh if that happened because I had nothing but respect for Josh. And when <laughs> when they lost to Dallas, Josh couldn't believe it. He was as stunned as anything. You know, I, did, I had a mate when I was younger too who was uh, a huge Lakers fan. And after the Lakers in 2004 beat Minnesota, he was saying, well, I may as well get my, my Lakers DVD now, the championship DVD now, I may as well order it. But they still had to go for Detroit. And then they got their asses kicked by Detroit. And he had the same look of shock on his face. And Josh couldn't quite get it. I don't think anybody has really made a whole lot of sense of that finals loss. I know Mike Fry has talked about it extensively, but... You know, the more the more I think about it, it's it's hard to really fathom what happened. In that, when you line up the teams in terms of talent, it's it's almost impossible to come to the, the conclusion. If you don't know what the result is, and you line those two teams up with talent, uh, how many people are going to come to the conclusion that Dallas is going to win that series? It's it's not very many people would. <laughs> they really wouldn't. And it was around this time that a little bit after that i got a text message and i had to i got i got a new phone so yeah yeah we know the whole joke now you know new phone who dis but it was like that i got a new phone and i got a text message from a number that i didn't recognize but i i didn't realize it was josh and it was him telling me that he had a brain tumor and i thought it was joke because you know I, i hung around with some dickheads, some real idiots when I was growing up. And that would play these stupid, stupid pranks on people. So I thought it was these cocksuckers, right? It wasn't. It was Josh. And I I remember, first of all, trying to call the number, and there was no answer, obviously. And I let it go for a couple of days, and then I found out through Matt Crow, who I've referenced a few times on this show, uh, that it was that it was Josh that had a brain tumor, and I I didn't know what to do. I really didn't. So first of all, I I asked Matt, you know, do you know the room number? And Matt gave me the room number. He told me when to go, and I ran went around there. And Josh was he was in good spirits, you know. He he had just had some. I'm not. I actually I don't know if he had tests done yet or not. But I remember going around there, and we talked for like four hours and that's without exaggeration if anything that's underestimating it it could have been longer and 
I'll never forget walking out of there. And I remember thinking, he's not going to beat this. You know, sometimes people say that, oh, you know, you're going to win this or whatever. I just felt him like there was like this voice in my head. It wasn't me actively working it out or anything like that. This was a voice inside my head saying, he's not going to, he's not going to win this. And, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, then the NBA lockout hit, right? And this is important, right? And the NBA lockout hit. And originally Michael Jordan was meant to come down to Australia for the, um, I think it's the Ryder Cup. It's where you've got the, the international team versus the US team. And Jordan was going to be the caddy or the coach or something. But because of the lockout, uh, he decided to stay because he felt like he, he should stay and help resolve that because he's an owner, right? So Dwayne Wade came down to Australia. And it was such a good thrill to find out that Dwayne Wade, Josh was going to be able to meet Dwayne. Because as I said before, huge Miami Heat fan, even bigger Dwayne Wade fan. And he met him, he had his photograph taken with uh, with Josh uh, it, was, it was it was good. It, uh, I think that you know, between me and you guys, I think that really lifted his his spirits, and the power of the of the human spirit in situations like that cannot be underestimated. If you've got nothing to go on for, if you've got no reason, people can go a lot quicker than they probably should, and I think that really really lifted him. And. It was, I should mention that the, the the brain tumor, why people were getting so worried about it, it was, it was right at the back of his head. And he, um, they couldn't operate on it. Because if they removed it, there was a good chance that he'd become paraplegic. He'd be in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. And he wouldn't be able to use his arms or his legs. And he did not want that. I had spoken to him. He did not want that. And, uh... And yeah, so the the lockout happened. Sorry, <laughs> I was just thinking about it. Man, life is fragile, isn't it? But um, and we take it for granted, but it's very, very, very fragile. But then, so getting back on on this story though, the lockout ended, and I remember talking to Josh a few times. I said, "Look, because we we didn't always want to talk about the tumor." You know, a lot of times we talk about video games, we talk about movies, and we talk obviously about basketball. And I remember telling him that because he was still, bum- he was. It seemed like he was more bummed out about the uh, the Miami Heat losing than what was going on with him health wise. Obviously, that wasn't the case. But Josh was, you know, somebody that that had the ability to uh, deflect a lot especially from people being concerned about his own health and then obviously so we could deflect so people wouldn't harp on that and didn't talk about sports, myself included. And I said to him, I said, look, Jordan lost against the Pistons and that toughened him up and then he went on a a rampage. We may see this from LeBron now. And ho and behold, you know, they went uh, went on and won the title that year, but not without their tribulations. And I remember after game six against Boston, I remember talking to Josh, and I stand by this. People say that I'm a big LeBron hater, but I I swear to God, after I watched that game, I was on the phone to Josh, and we were talking for about an hour, and I said to him, I said that no, no one has had more pressure than in one single game than what LeBron had on him in that game six against Boston. Because if he loses that game, there's no coming back from that. The the Miami Heat uh, super team would have been cons- considered an absolute failure at that point. He he was in Boston, a place where really he hadn't won before. I mean, I know they won the they had won the season uh, prior to, but that was with Rondo being injured. All the pressure was against him, especially after the game five when uh, Pierce hit that three on uh, right in LeBron's face. And I said to him, I said, dude, what he overcame there was, was special. And, and from Jordan to Wilt to Magic to Shaq to all those players, Kobe, nobody has had more external pressure on them 
than LeBron at this stage because he had never won a title. And had he not won in that, those circumstances, well, it's hard to recover from that. And, of course, they would go on and, and win the championship against Oklahoma. Josh was starting to get better at this time too, believe it or not, physically. Uh, he was in remission. And he was he was going to the gym. He was he was back playing basketball, and it was great. I was able to play with him again. It was it was it was amazing. You know, I played rugby in in front of thousands and thousands of people. My favorite memory from an athletic standpoint, though, <laughs> was a pickup game that should have never happened. It should have never happened. Me, uh, Josh, and I went up to the courts to shoot around, and. I just had swish pants on. I was not expecting a hard workout <laughs> at all. No, 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 no. Josh is always prepared, though. He had he had his shorts and all his gear on. Um, I just had swish pants and a t-shirt and basketball shoes on, and we're going through the motions and you know doing the beat the player and and all that those fun shooting drills. And Mahesh, uh, who actually plays professional basketball over in India now. Isn't it incredible how much the game has grown now when you think about that? Uh, he was at the courts and Mahesh's mate Danny was there too. And Josh was like, dude, let's play him. Let's, let's play him two on two. So I'm like, sure, let's do it. Let's absolutely do it. Even though I had freaking swish pants and you've got no idea how heavy swish pants can be uh, after you've worked up a sweat. Because on the outside, it's polyester. On the inside, it's freaking cotton. So they're heavy. <laughs> they're heavy as anything. And you work up this massive sweat because the outside, as I said, polyester. So the things don't breathe. So all that lower body heat turns into sweat. <laughs> and I laugh at that, man. I, I, I would give anything to go back on that day. I really would. Because Josh was on fire, making every shot. And it got to the point where that would... In a game of two or two, they were doubling him. So I had a very easy life in that game. I was just knocking down jumpers and or, or just cutting and getting layoffs. It was very, very easy. And that, I don't if Mahesh, if you're listening to this, this is not a disrespect or anything, man. But we owned you guys that day. <laughs> it was so much fun. It was so much fun. And it was the last time I was I was able to play with Josh because. About two months after that, it had come back. The cancer had come back. And uh, I remember getting... Josh called me to tell me about this one. And he said that it's, it wasn't... He wasn't confident that uh, he was going to come out of it. And I remember just going around to his place and and just sitting down with him and just just talking and I'll never share those conversations with anyone those are between me and Josh and you know it's kind of hard because I think about everything that I've done in the last year year and a bit in terms of the changes in my life you know moving to the United States you know, all that stuff and I, I wish you could have been there you know it's, uh, but it's it's um it was an, it was it was an interesting time but when he was sick i saw this guy that was as i said 6 foot 6 athletic could dunk with either hand could move really quickly very strong i've worked out with him before and yeah, we would we'll leave it at that point uh, <laughs> in terms of that. But obviously, he he declined physically. His mind was still sharp. But I remember just watching movies with him and just talking to him, just spending time with him, and. <sighs> It was, it was one of the hardest things, and I've I've had to 
bury family members and things like that. Nothing was as hard as when Josh uh, was going through that. And and then, of course, it transitioned into the hospital. And he knew he wasn't coming out. And he still, on the exterior, he tried to have everyone believe that there was a hope. And then there was about a, a week and a half where I, I, because he went to the hospital for some tests and he came back out of those tests and there was when I say a week and a half that's probably not accurate it was probably a little bit longer and it was I hadn't heard from him and I was messaging him I was like dude is everything okay just let me know um, you know it was, it was weird it was probably similar to like if a parent was, uh, had you know, their child had run away. I was like, just, you know, if you don't feel like talking, I understand, but just, you know, just even prank my phone or something like that, just, you know, I'm concerned because I didn't know if anything had happened and I just hadn't been told, you know, your mind starts to play tricks on you and stuff like that into uh, circumstances like that. And then I got a message from uh, his mother. His mother responded and she said, he's at... Um, Royal North Shore Hospital. And uh, it doesn't look good. So the very next day, I I went to visit him. And I came when they were washing him, like the nurses were washing him, because he couldn't... He didn't have the, the capacity to do so. And uh, so I was waiting outside... And the the nurse said, oh, you can go in now. And I went in. I can only imagine the pain that he was in at that point. And I went in and his eyes were closed. He was still alive. I could hear him breathing. His eyes were closed. I said, hey, Josh, it's, it's Matt. And I've never seen anybody open their eyes quicker. Um, it was only one eye, though because one of the other eyes was, was closed. He couldn't open the other one. And um, that shook me up pretty hard. I couldn't tell you what I said to him for those 20 or 30 minutes. And God only knows how I didn't cry. <laughs> cry. Um, because I, I broke my heart. It really did break my heart to to see him go through that. Nobody deserved that, and and I was just talking to him, man. I was, I, I, as I said, I wouldn't be able to tell you even what was. I do remember saying to him, "Look, you know, you're a warrior. You'll get through this. You know, you, you know, you, you've gotten through it this far. You will get through this." Um, I think it's just safe to say he didn't believe me. <laughs> Um, it's weird that I laugh at that uh, was that saying you either laugh or you cry I um, much, pref- much prefer to laugh and uh, when he and continued to get worse to get it worse um, to the point where he's he couldn't uh, keep his other eye open he was essentially the way he would communicate was by pouting his lips so we had to sort of spell out words for him think think to uh if you've ever seen breaking bad and hector and when people try to communicate with him they have like the wheel or the 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 arrow that goes across so without obviously we couldn't use that because he couldn't use his eyes so we actually had to say is it a to k or i'm sorry a to j or k to z and if it was A to K, he pout his lips. If not, it's the other one. And then we go through the letters and we try to spell out the words. And um, it just got worse and worse and worse, as you can imagine. And man, it was rough. It was really rough. And it, it got to the point where it was uh, January the 2nd just a couple of days after New Year's Eve. And I believe this was 2013. And 
told the family to be around. I was at the hospital pretty much every day. Um, and I went around there. And they said he had a real rough night. And you could just see the, how tired his family was. Like just emotionally exhausted. And <clears throat> the, uh, I don't know how long I was there. I, I couldn't tell you what time I got there. Um, it was a bit of a blur. But what I will tell you is, you know, we went and got dinner uh, for the family. And um, we came back. And we ate. <laughs> and um, after we ate, I, I had left. And I was driving home. And I got a phone call from Josh's mum. And I was driving, so I was trying to pull over. And I remember in my mind thinking, this is either really, really good or it's really, really bad. It was either good news, like he, like he started talking, like a miracle had happened, or or he had passed. And, um, and unfortunately, it was the latter. And I'll never forget the words, we, we had lost... We had lost Josh. So I, I turned around, got back there as, as soon as I could. And he was gone. He was gone. So it took me a while to sort of get my head on straight after that. I was a bit of a mess. As you can probably imagine. And I will never get over that. I will never ever be at peace with that. And it just sucked because I, I lost my best friend. But the, the, the saving, the, the, the silver lining and all of that. And I know it's corny and cliche. Because a lot of people will say, well, they're not suffering anymore. He really he wasn't suffering anymore after he had passed away. Because I can only imagine the pain that man was going through. I can only imagine it. Uh, I don't think there's a whole lot of people that I've respected more in my life than him. And then... I had thought about it and decided that my tribute to Josh, because originally I was just going to get a tattoo with his jersey number and my jersey number. And I thought, no, to hell with it. I'm going to do that blog. I'm going to do that blog and it's going to be about the greatest players of all time and rank them. And I'm going to have his voice inside my head telling me whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong. Of course, that blog was called Outside the Hype, which is now branched off to I Still Love This Game and has now developed into the podcast. So that is why a rugby player from Australia talks about basketball. And uh, this show should be co-hosted. It should be hosted by Josh McDonald and Matthew Damien. To me, it is co-hosted because I haven't forgotten you, man. And I never will. <laughs>